Welcome to Imperfect Momming. Our children are constantly looking to us for examples. The term role model doesn't quite cut it here. We are shaping their worldview with every move we make. You see, it's not in the lectures we give or moments where we are actively attempting to teach them. It's in the micro movements we make, the unconscious ways in which we navigate life. We are constantly teaching our children how to show up for themselves, their friends, their future partners, and even their future children. So what can we do to ensure we are raising thoughtful, compassionate, self-aware human beings? We have to become them ourselves. No one is perfect, but we can still all be better, and it starts with self-healing. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Imperfect Momming, and we have a very special guest today, and I'm going to have you introduce yourself because I didn't confirm how to say your name. <laughs> I'm Parijat Deshpande. Wow, say that one more time just for fun. Sure. Parijat Deshpande, just as it's spelled. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do. Yeah, well, I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm so glad we're connecting. Um, so I'm Parijat, and I am mom to two rainbow babies who are no longer babies. Um, and I work with, I run a company, actually, that has a mission of improving high-risk pregnancy outcomes and ending prematurity. And we do that through three different ways. One-on-one -on -one concierge level support through high-risk pregnancy. Uh, we do presentations, keynotes, and professional trainings, and then we partner with um, TV and film uh, producers and screenwriters to make sure that there's accurate representation of high-risk pregnancies mm -hmm. and prematurity in the media. So it's a little serendipitous, the conversation that we had pre-recording. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to fill in our listeners since we weren't recording. Uh, so you and I had an appointment scheduled at some point uh, last month, and um, I actually haven't told any of this story to, uh, on my podcast. So um, I missed our appointment because I was in the hospital and I was either giving birth or I was in the hospital because I was in a fender bender, but it put me into preterm labor. So my listeners know that I was pregnant with twins as a surrogate and um so this was um, super interesting to me, the, the car accident, because I had, I knew that when you're in a fender bender that you need to get checked out, you need to go to labor and delivery um, to make sure that everything's fine because things like placenta, placentas can get disrupted and, or detached. And um, I don't even know all the lingo because I didn't know that it, I just knew that I needed to get checked out. And um, when I did, I was uh, in, I was in labor and they had to um, stop it. And it spent, I spent five days in the hospital. Um, and since then the babies were born, um, they were born at 36 weeks, which is full term for twins. And apparently also really um, uncommon. Twins typically spend some time in the NICU. They didn't, they weren't in the NICU at all. They were both over five pounds. Wow. Um, and I was really proud of my body because every other pregnancy I've gone into preterm labor, they've always been able to stop it. I never had the earliest I had a baby was like 34 in like five days, I want to say. Um, but every other baby was 38 or more. Um, and so I was, I always was like, well, my body just has this point where it's done. <laughs> <laughs> done working done working done being pregnant I mean my brain has that same like mode but um it my body's like okay I'm done um and I love that you guys work with media because I, nobody does that with surrogacy no nope. and when if you are a surrogate and you watch friends then Phoebe giving birth to <laughs> triplets right. <laughs> and they transferred like six embryos and three of them <laughs> attached and I'm like I don't know if they did that in the 90s but they do <laughs> not do that now like no. it, maybe the octobomb had 15 <laughs> embryos transferred but you know that's not normal I don't know how many she had transferred but 
um she had eight babies so there was a lot <laughs> yeah that's right that's right but yeah so i will i will give the floor back to you and um i i just i think that that that's that's so that's such a an important mission because people don't know what they don't know and if it's misrepresented in the in the media i mean i get lots of questions about phoebe's surrogacy <laughs> that's right if you could if you can believe it people think that it was legit and factual and you know don't you want to keep the babies and yes like, okay i mean some people might want to keep them, but you know, there's lots of things I want that I don't do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. Our our second we had with the help of a gestational carrier and that we got questions like that as intended parents of, are you afraid she's going to keep the baby? And we're like, no, she has her own. She's good. <laughs> like, um, And lots of references to friends because of that. Absolutely. And and it was like from both of those things, my my older was a micro preemie. And I remember the day before he was born, the only other micro preemie I knew was, are you familiar with, um, oh gosh, what is their name? The Duggar family. They're the big giant family in Arkansas. And they used to have a reality show. Kids. Lots and lots of kids. Yeah. yeah, like 19 or something kids. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were the only one that I knew that had a 25 weeker and my son was a 24 weeker. And I was like, what does this baby look like? I don't even know. And is she OK? Because I think it was a few years before I delivered. And I'm looking at them like, this cannot be the only source of information that parents have as they're preparing for something that's difficult. I mean, as much as I love friends. Uh, that can't be the source of information. And, and if we're going to do it that way, which I totally understand in combining education and entertainment, let's get the education right, at least. Yes. <laughs> let's let's get it appropriate and accurate. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of both of those experiences really drove that leg of the mission for sure. So I, I have two questions. I'm going to ask them both because otherwise I'll forget. So the first question is, I think I understand what a micro preemie is based on what your what you just said, but let's define it in case I'm wrong. And then the other question is, is this a company you work for or is this a company you founded? I don't recall. Now I'm throwing my food everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. This is a company that I founded uh, as a result of my personal experiences of a complicated family building journey. And it started with my older, who was a micro preemie, which is generally defined as born before 28 weeks and or smaller than two pounds, uh, depending on the hospital, depending on where you are, somewhere around that. That's kind of the general guideline for that. So he was a 24 weeker, so several weeks prior to the end of the second trimester yeah. uh, and you know the earlier that they're born the longer the NICU you stay of course but then also the longer you're kind of on this road of dealing with the impact of prematurity and i say that because a lot of things that we had heard when he was in the NICU or once he was home was oh yeah i know so and so had a preemie and they were fine and they were okay after six months or they caught up after two years and when we probed a little further, you know, those preemies were born at 34 weeks, 32 weeks. And and it's very important, I think, for parents to recognize that the gestational age at which a baby is born really does impact kind of the long term path that you're on. That's not to say you're doomed forever and everything's going to be terrible forever, but that your challenges are going to be different if you have a baby born at 24 weeks versus a baby born at 28 versus 32 versus 34. Mm -hmm. And the more we can, I know we were not prepared for that in, in a lot of ways because we thought people around us would understand and be able to support that. And they didn't understand because nobody talks about that, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's uh, crucial to just kind of put out there and just kind of FYI for people who are listening if you're at risk of delivering that early, um, that I found it really helpful to meet with other parents who had babies born around a similar gestational age. So being just a preemie parent wasn't even specific enough. I found my yeah. best supports from people who had delivered around the same gestational age that I, I did. Yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And this was not anything that I had any awareness around um, prior to 
this pregnancy because it wasn't, and I, I still wouldn't even say that I'm well informed. Um, my, the intention, the intended mother of these twins was a researcher and I've always defined myself as not a researcher. Um, and, um, but it was like everything that they did to stop the pregnancy or to stop the, the delivery, um, she would, she was researching it. They want, she wanted yeah. to know about what the magnesium was doing. She wanted to know about, um, the, um, I had this word in my head earlier and now it's gone. Um, but the, the medication, the contraction medication that they were, that they had me on my fetipine I remembered mm -hmm. um my friend was just telling me that uh her she started an antidepressant and the uh it's it she said it's stopping her from grabbing words and I'm like are you sure that's not just motherhood because <laughs> I I'm not on an antidepressant and I can't find my words at all <laughs> that does happen when we're exhausted too for sure um no, I just, I, I'm always so impressed. Um, and I, I think it's a lot, a lot of people do this, but, but I'm really impressed by people that go through something that I see as tremendous pain and use it to better the world and to, you know, in a lot of ways, heal the world or inform the world like you're doing. And, and, um, and I just, I want to say that I honor you for, for this um, company that you've created and for the awareness that you're putting out there. And um, it's, it's what an, what an impact and what a like mission that you have. And I think it's beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. And a girlfriend of mine, I don't remember how early her daughter was born, but um, I want to say it was in the twenties, 26, maybe even. Um, and just watching the story on, on Facebook, um, and, and, you know, the, in, in all honesty, the avoiding of the story and avoiding the pictures, because it's not, yeah. it's hard to see. Yeah. And I believe I was pregnant at the time. And I was like, I just can't have these images in my head. And, and, you know, but I, I reached out to her, you know, to ask her if there was anything that I could do, but the pic, the images of, of creamy babies is, is really just disheartening. Yeah, it is definitely something. I think that's why I was looking for that photo because I wanted to know mm -hmm. what is my child approximately going to look like? Cause I knew he wasn't going mm -hmm. to look like the babies that I had met, that I had seen pictures of that are generally shared publicly. I knew that he wasn't going to look like that, but I didn't know what he was going to look like. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of what the baby looks like as a as a person, and then you add on all of the tubes and wires and machinery and everything that kind of takes over that little tiny body. It's scary. It's scary to see, yeah. absolutely. It's not something yeah. I think any parent wants to see and it's certainly not something that we are often prepared for for sure and i remember being pregnant with my son and um i was again i went into preterm labor around 30 weeks um and they were able to stop it but it, before that moment it what it wasn't real it, it, and it, and it's hard for me to explain. And I, and I always like, I'm like, am I just a weird person? Because I didn't feel this connection to my, my unborn child until I was started imagining what he would look like at three pounds. Oh, sure. And then he became like, he went from being, I'm pregnant to, you know, this is Xander. And Xander, yeah. Xander's coming soon. And I got to keep him in as much as, as long as I can. Um, yeah. But it wasn't until that imagining that I made the connection of that. Oh, this is, he's a person. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So is there anything that else really, or are there, uh, so are there Facebook groups that you've, 
created that kind of bring these moms together or is there other ways that they can connect with each other? So, um, no, I don't have a Facebook group. I find that people kind of congregate on my Instagram account or I have an inner circle where we actually get to dive more into the content of trauma-informed neurobiological approaches to health in general. Um, and so we have a community lounge there that can be anonymized because I found a lot of people that were kind of coming closer to us wanted the anonymity, right, for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. They they don't want to share publicly with their name, their face or anything like that, which I completely understand. And yeah. I, I even remember after my son was born or no, maybe I, he hadn't, he wasn't born quite yet, but it was getting close. And a friend of mine who had delivered at 28 weeks a year prior, she was like, don't share pictures and don't share his name publicly uh, online, at least on social media right away. I was like, oh, okay. Why? I mean, I didn't, I hadn't even thought that far, so it hadn't even yeah. crossed my mind. And she had mentioned that there's there's just a lot of ugliness on social media, people taking pictures, people using stories. You might have mm -hmm. seen those kinds of somebody pretending to be somebody else. And apparently that happens a lot in the communities where there's kind of health-related pictures, whether it's babies or otherwise. And so I thought that was very interesting. And then when I started the company, I was – really asking a lot of the people that were coming closer and asking for more, asking for support. It's like, would you be interested in a community where you want to share uh, publicly? Would you want your name associated with it, your, your face? And the overwhelming answer was no. I'd prefer mm -hmm. for it to be private. Yeah. So we really prioritize confidentiality and anonymity in all the work that we do. We never ask anybody, even for testimonials, uh, from clients or anything that it's always what are you comfortable sharing and we will absolutely honor that so between the Instagram account and the inner circle um, people often find me through my book as well and and that's you know we and then we just have a lot of conversations that also happen over email people sending us their stories and experiences and asking how we can help for their future pregnancies too that's really great it's it, and that's an aspect that I wouldn't have thought of is the um, people wanting to be anonymous because my friend was so open about it and so vocal yeah, about it. And, that's right. And, yeah. Um, and I would imagine, you know, there's, there's a feeling of judgment. Like, I mean, moms, moms feel like they're being judged, whether it, it's happening or not. Um, but like, well, what'd you do wrong? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I'm, and you know, my, my friend, that, that was kind of, it, it wasn't like I had that, that thought, well, why did that happen? You know, not yeah. what did you do wrong, but right. like, why did that happen? And I think I asked her, I was like, was there anything like, was there a reason? Was there like a you know, and, and, um, that, that brings up a good, uh, thought in my head, like, are there questions that, that we can, that we shouldn't be asking that feel, mm. feel judgmental to, to a mom that's going through this? Oh, I love this question. Yeah, there's, I I can speak from personal experience that it was those questions like, do you know why this happened? And I know mm. that, you, you know, even my, my parents ask this, close loved ones, they just want to understand, right? Because mm. it's something in our community, at least, had never happened before. Nobody knew about it. Nobody talked about it. So what? How? And, and there was this perception that this only happens to a certain demographic of people. There was an assumption yes. that, well, you did everything right. You did your prenatal appointments. You actually lived at the doctor for some time. You took all your vitamins. You ate, ate. Well, what could it have been? And and still, I think, as hearing that question, especially when we didn't have the answers ourselves yet, um, after the fact, but then also when we were going through it and we're trying to figure out what the answers were, they were not just judgmental, but I would say it added pressure because it mm. added a layer of 
I need to now take care of you because you're uncomfortable with my experience when I'm already trying to figure out how to navigate my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, questions like that or if you find that your baby is in the NICU, whether preterm or full term, because full term babies do also end up in the NICU sometimes, uh, asking when they're going to come home. What's keeping them from coming home? What's going on? Why aren't they being discharged yet? Like we totally get you want our babies home with us. We want that so badly. You have no idea. And it's complicated. It's so complicated that I think even NICU parents, like we barely get, you know, we catch on because we're there and we get the cadence of the unit. We understand the lingo really well. But even then, we're still like, okay, but when? (laughs) When can they come home? And so I think really focusing those questions on what do you need? How can I best support you? Do you need an ear? I'm going to the grocery store. Can I pick something up for you? And really offering that practical type of support or asking them what they need is super helpful. And then to really acknowledge for yourself, because it's, it is real that as a loved one, you are also having an experience watching them go through this to find your own support system for that. That is not the person going through it. Right. And that was going to be my next question is what questions should we ask instead or how can we, you know, be supportive to a mom and, and dad and family going through this? Because it's not like you said, it's not just mom. Yeah. It is the support system. It's the loved ones. Um, and, you know, I, I genuinely believe that because I've gotten some really weird questions um, as a surrogate and uh, the one that pops into my mind is uh, something along the lines of well are you are you going to keep one of them what 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 do you mean they're (laughs) twins they belong together like I know that they used to separate twins with in adoption and or maybe they still do I don't I don't know I haven't looked into that but like that's no this isn't an adoption process they're not my babies of course she's gonna get both of them right um and and there's and I know that people mean the mean well with their questions they're just yes that's right they're just curious you know I I asked and I'm going to use the air quotes wrong question to my friend you know because I asked her when she's going to come home I probably asked all of the questions that you just said (laughs) you know and I know I know my heart and I know that most people have a similar desire to to understand and to be helpful and to support yes and, you know, there's, and, and inside of that, we also, depending on the relationship you have with the person, you, you kind of feel like there might not be any questions that are off limits or there, you sure. don't even know that there's questions that are insensitive. Um, but everybody is really trying to, 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 like you said, understand. Yeah. Exactly. And I think we're very lucky at this time where there is so much information available online that it's easy for, easier, I guess, for loved ones to look up and say, what does a 24-weeker mean? How long is a 24-weeker typically in the NICU? And you can find these general answers online so that you can then reserve the questions and conversations with your loved one with ways that only you can support them with, right? Maybe you're the chef of the family and so you can drop off delicious food for them to actually enjoy one meal out of the day. Or, you know, you're the best friend and so you can be that shoulder that nobody else can be and then have that separation a little bit to really preserve the beauty of the relationship that you have with that person. Mm. Yeah. I'm I, just a person that popped into my mind right now is a uh, um, another girl who was pregnant with twins that was she was four weeks behind me, mm-hmm. and she had her babies on uh, the thirteenth of this month, and um, and there she she told me that they'll be in the NICU for a couple more weeks, and um, but uh, that they're doing really well. Um, and she popped into my head because she said that while she's waiting for 
uh, her babies to come home. She's going to be listening to my podcast for some distraction and for some Fantastic. things. So, um, I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, but uh, it's it's so easy, I think, to support our our loved ones now. It's a lot easier in in what you just mentioned. Bring bring them some food, or you know, Grubhub or yeah, you know uber like there's so many different ways or you could or instacart like you know hey what can i get you what groceries do you need like there's and there's a whole episode that we did on on that um you know ways to support a new mom yeah um and those are those are things that we can do uh for moms whose whose babies are currently in the NICU because it's hard yeah it's really hard like you have an expectation when you get pregnant that when you give birth that you're coming home with a baby. That's right. And when that's not what happens, then it's it's really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there a piece of advice that you want to share with uh, moms listening? I think it would be to remember that you know what you and your child needs best above mm. everybody else, above anybody else. You know, you know. And I know that we say that sometimes and it's a great kind of like cheer, but I really want to highlight that there's reality behind that too. It's not just words that sound nice. You are with this child every second of every day. You are seeing their face. You are seeing their little bodies change, whether it's in the NICU or at home, whether it's newborn phase, toddler phase, beyond. You know the inflections in their voice. You are the one who can tell when that's an angry cry because I'm wet versus I'm hungry and how dare you haven't fed me in two hours. You know the difference. And so trust that above everything else and then build your village with people who trust you to trust that. Mm. Man, that's a whole topic. <laughs> that's a whole podcast topic. But that build your village with people who trust you that's he I like I've heard you know we have intuition and I 100% agree with that and we forget that we have intuition um it's something that I talk about a lot like your intuition is there for a reason a woman's intuition is is huge but build your community. <laughs> Ooh, the dog liked that. Build your community. <laughs> um, to of people who trust you. That's because so often we look for other people to tell us what our intuition is. That's right. That's what I did. Yeah, I, would, I was reaching outside me a lot in the beginning and I and I don't think that there's anything wrong with asking for feedback or reading a book or whatever just trust that that intuition oh that gave me chills mm -hmm. is there a book that's been instrumental in your journey well I didn't find it when I was pregnant so I wrote it uh I don't know if that counts that, I'll take it. <laughs> um, I wrote Pregnancy Brain specifically for people going through a high-risk pregnancy because it was the book that I wished I'd had. That, um, you know, I found it very frustrating that um, I was pregnant, I was dealing with complication after complication, and every pregnancy book that a well-meaning friend had dropped at my doorstep had at most two pages about a high-risk pregnancy, and it was mm -hmm. such generic information and not helpful to me in any way and not even just not helpful in the sense of I didn't under I didn't learn enough but it was like I felt I wasn't being seen that my experience didn't count 
because it didn't fit into this nicely, neatly built out timeline of your baby is now the size of a pineapple and this is all the wonderful stuff that's happening and I'm like not happening I don't think I even made it to pineapple stage you know like yeah. it's I I didn't feel seen and so that was a book that I wrote um in hopes that that would help people on that complicated path mm -hmm. feel seen feel heard feel valued that this is real and this is your experience and it it matters to talk about and to give you the resources that you need that are different than a low-risk pregnancy uh, to help you stay pregnant and and have hope for a better outcome than maybe what you're being quoted as possible. So I think that's that's that one. But on a personal side, I would say um, the book that I I loved reading that really changed a lot for me was Shonda Rhimes' Year of Yes. Really enjoyed that one. Year of Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah, I think, but I think it, I'm gonna have to look it up. It came out a few years ago, um, yeah. and I loved it because it was the first time I had heard a woman, a mother, talk very openly about I have help, and that's how I do it. Mm. And I just went, oh! I read that chapter a hundred times, <laughs> going, yeah. "Oh, we're not actually supposed to do this by ourselves." Okay, and she just talked about it with no shame, no judgment. She acknowledged the shame and judgment that comes to her, but she's like, I know that if I value my career and I value my role as a mother, I cannot do it by myself. It's not physically mm -hmm. possible. And I just went, oh, okay, permission to get help, permission to ask for help. Isn't that crazy that we need, we, we feel like we need the permission. I know, right? I know. I'm reading a book right now that I bought, who knows when I bought it. I haven't read it. I hadn't read it until now. I didn't pick, I didn't pick it up. Um, I almost put it back down because in the, oh, in the intro, it sounds like her life was just so perfect, mm. <laughs> you know, just, and, and that there was no, there were no obstacles. And I was like, but I'm sure there were obstacles. She just isn't mentioning them right now. I'm going to keep reading, <laughs> but the book is called, um, getting shit done and uh and she i mean it's she talks a lot about um the gender roles and um how women are expected really to to do it all and when you said what you said about um about your book the um i i, I rewatch shows as i fall asleep because or i listen to shows as i fall asleep um, that I've already seen because then I don't have to pay attention. Um, but I, I'm rewatching House right now. Oh, yeah. And the um, the dean of medicine, Lisa Cuddy, has adopts a baby, and uh, one of the characters says to her that a man in your position would have an assistant at at work, and would have a nanny and a wife at home. Yeah. And he, and he says, you women <laughs> judge yourself for not being able to do it all when, when this, a man would have four people helping him do all the things that you're trying yes. to do by yourself. Yes, yes, exactly. And I, and I saw an Instagram video or Facebook or whoever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, the difference between when my wife is sick and when I'm sick and when wife is sick, she's in her robe and she's running around doing all the housework. And when husband is sick, he's sitting on the couch with the thermometer in his mouth and remote in his hand and sick wife is supporting him. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so true. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice to see it changing a little bit, mm -hmm. at least from our parents' generation to ours. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that it'll change even more for our kids' generation and beyond, for sure. But yeah, you're, you're right. It's, um, it's an, an expectation for men still to have help. And if we really think about the history of humans, we are always had help we were never supposed to be this isolated and mm -hmm. that's outside of the pandemic that keeps going on like mm -hmm. even before that 
we have started living such isolated lives. I mean, the nuclear family wasn't a thing. We had actual villages. And so if it's not a hired nanny, it's your aunt, it's your cousin, it's your grandmother. Somebody's there because you're not supposed to do it all. You are literally not built to be everybody to your family. You can't. And yet we get all these messages from everywhere that you're supposed to be and you're failing if you're not until somebody like Shonda Rhyme says, actually, <laughs> I have help. And it's a novel concept that made me stop in my tracks, which you're right. Like it took me a minute to also reflect on why is this taking my breath away? Why is this the first time I've heard this? Yeah. Okay, so I didn't catch the name the first time you said it, but now that you've said Shonda Rhimes again, I actually did a, um, a, a solo episode of my podcast. I'm using air quotes because I took a two minute TikTok of her, of that somebody had um, put together of a speech of hers. And I dissected it because I thought it was so interesting. And I remember her saying that she has help and uh, something about, you know, here's how I do it all. I don't. Right. And right. It, she's very funny with that. Like that's um, yeah. So, and, and a book that I mentioned a couple of times on the podcast, I haven't finished it, but I know the, the gist of it, someone I think somebody recommended it on the podcast. It's called Hunt, Gather, Parent. Oh, I haven't heard that one. And it's about how Western civilization is the nuclear family, like you said, and mom has to, is, is everything to everybody and does it all herself versus in village, you know, in other places where it takes a village. Like that's where that saying comes from is not that, you know, this abstract concept of it takes a village to raise a, ch a child. No, literally yeah. other places have villages raising children. Yeah, that's right. So thank you for represencing that and um, for for adding, you know, building your community of people that, that, uh, that trust your intuition and trust you. And I, I feel like there's a blog coming. Um, <laughs> let our uh, listeners know where they can find you. Sure. Uh, all the links to everything are on my website, which is my full name.com, barijatdeshpande.com. But I'm typically on LinkedIn or, and you can find me from my name, or I'm on Instagram, which is healthy.highriskpregnancy. And the links to my book and the inner circle and how to work with me are all on my website as well as my socials. And tell me the name of your book, just in case somebody doesn't want to click on a link and, and they just want to Google. Sure. It's called Pregnancy Brain, a mind-body approach to stress management during a high-risk pregnancy. Mm. Perfect. Um, thank you again for for being on the podcast and for what you're doing in the world and for taking, you know, your your pain and, and using it to, to help others because I, I believe that that's why we're here and that's why we go through the stuff that we go through and, and um I don't remember who wrote the book on that, that I, I, this fundamentally changed my life, but there's a woman who wrote a book and she was a grief counselor and she was a grief counselor because her husband in, in his thirties passed away just mm -hmm. suddenly in the middle of, of his sleep. And she went through this two year long grief period of, of drugs and numbing and, and all that kind of fun stuff and had a dream one night that her soul was sitting in God's waiting room. And God said, who wants to teach humans how to grieve? And her soul raised its hand and she went down into, into earth. And, and then her husband raised his hand when God asked who wants to teach her how to grieve and every time I think about that it gives me chills I still don't know I like I 
they told me, but all I remember is the story. I never read the book or, or I don't know who she is, but I talk about her quite often, but that's what you remind me of when, when I see people like you who take a tragedy to help and use it to help, help others. So I honor you again for that. And thank you for sharing your story on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was so lovely to connect with you and to share a little bit with your audience as well. Well, there will be another episode of Imperfect Momming uh, for you all next week. And until then, keep healing. Bye, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Imperfect Momming. It's time for us to step up and realize that our power is not in trying to shape our children. Our power lies in shaping ourselves into the people we want our children to model themselves after. Don't just do it for your kids, do it for yourself. When you become a more self-aware, compassionate and confident person, you and everyone around you benefit. For more information about me and my work, visit alishalyons.com. That's A-L-Y-S-I-A. L-Y-O-N-S dot com. See you next time.